appreciate Gary and his song leading. Makes it a bit difficult with the mask on and probably were all of us to a certain extent according to the thickness of the mask. We are living in a time that uh, nobody's seen as far as our lifetime is concerned. If we had lived back in the 1918 along that time, we would have seen it far, far worse. But God is still in control. I appreciated what was said in Charlie's prayer a moment ago. God is in control. And I'd like for us this morning to look to the book of Esther. In my regular reading, I read the book of Esther yesterday, and I thought this is a good time to draw certain lessons out of this. You might want to turn to Exodus chapter 2. Verses 5 through 9, Exodus chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. Now, to save time, I'm not going to read Esther 2, 5 through 9, but I'll be making some remarks about Esther. For those who have been with us on our Wednesday night studies, we went through the Minor Prophets over a period of three weeks, survey, of course, and we spent two weeks then on the intertestamental period, which linked a lot of that up concerning what Daniel had to say and what he saw and how it was fulfilled during the 400 years between the Testaments. Well, in reading Esther and what I think is a good point to be made for us, especially at this time, and I thought this is, uh, will fit right in to those time periods that we spoke of in the intertestamental period, as well as a couple of the minor prophets. So you can read Esther 2, 5 through 9, and I hope that we'll be able to learn several lessons from the book of Esther because we need to be reminded always that God cares and provides for his people. His people in the Christian age is the Lord's church. Christians, as the Bible defines and uses the word Christian, the church of which you read about in the New Testament, those who have believed the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1.16, and have been baptized in Christ based upon their belief and repentance and confession of faith in Christ. And the Lord adds them to his church. Therein they live faithful to him as the New Testament teaches that faithfulness. God cares for his children. His children are special to him. If you will read the whole Old Testament concerning fleshly Israel, you will see that over and over and over and over again, he says, you do what I tell you, you obey me, you keep my precepts and commandments, and here's what's going to happen, and you will simply have blessing after blessing, but you disobey me, you rebel against me, and you will be punished. So when we come to this time in Esther, we see that the book, as you read through the text of Esther 2, 5 through 9, is set in the Persian Empire. And the time of the book of Esther occurs between the years 483 and 473 B.C. And that's some hundred or more years after the Jews went into Babylonian captivity. And the account of Esther properly fits in the historical section of the Old Testament between chapters 6 and 7 of the book of Nehemiah. In other words, the captivity is over and a remnant has returned to Israel. After Nehemiah's return to Israel, which was commissioned of the emperor or the king, to rebuild the walls, and before Ezra and his group returned to Israel, this is the time frame that Esther is set in. Now the Jewish people in the book of Esther then are those who remain behind in the Persian Empire while Nehemiah returned. The main characters of the book are Esther, of course, and her cousin Mordecai, the king of Persia, Ahasuerus, in secular history, most historians think Xerxes. There's some differences there due 
to this being such ancient history and the facts aren't as clear back in those days, but think it was Xerxes. And a real nice fellow by the name of Haman, and I say nice fellow with my tongue deep in my cheek. The purpose of the book of Esther, I get this, the purpose of the book of Esther is to explain the background and purpose of a feast. The feast of Purim. You can read about it in chapter 8, verses 26 through 28. 8, 26 through 28. There are certain key verses, and the key verses in this book are found in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Chapter 4, 13 and 14. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, because they know of this plan by Haman to destroy all of the Jews on a certain date, and that he's got a decree from the king to do it by deception and so forth. So he says to Esther, who is already the queen, and you can read earlier in the book to see how that came to pass, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So this is one of the books in which we see God's providence. You will not find God mentioned anywhere in the book. And yet you cannot read hardly a verse in the book without realizing God permeates all of it. Because it is talking about God's providential care for his children. And how this feast of Purim actually brought that to the minds in the Jews after it was all over with. So I say again, there's no direct mention of God in the book of Esther. But we ought to know this, for these things were written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, and there it would be no testament scriptures, might have hope. Romans 15, 4. We see what's going on on the stage after much practice has been done by the actors in a given play. But we do not see all that went on before and all the people that were involved in the production and that are working behind the scenes. And God works behind the scenes of our daily lives. We know that the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed to us and our children forever. So Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. So we need to know that as we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto us. And this is exactly in the area of God protecting his children and taking care of them in a very bad situation is what we see. Now, none of us here have ever been in a situation like uh, the Jews were in this case, to where a wicked man had Haman, had got the king to come up with a decree that on a given date, then all the enemies of the Jews could have free reign at slaughtering as many as they could destroy throughout the whole of the great Persian Empire. Well, let's go back then with those things in mind as time will allow. The story in this is where Queen Vashti, in chapter 1, would not obey the king in presenting herself and all of her glory as the queen to a gathering. And thus she basically was deposed by the king. It was then that Esther and other maidens were brought out and a selection was made from them and it fell upon Esther to become the queen. Chapter 2, 1 through 20. Esther kept her nationality a secret. Mordecai was in service to the king. Chapter 2, 21 through 23. 
And he was in the court, and any of those courts, wherever there was absolute monarchies, were places of intrigue, lying and deception and vying for favor. And the king or the monarch always had to be on guard. Well, because he was there, Mordecai, he happened to be in a position to hear two eunuchs plotting the king's assassination. And he made it known to the king, and these two were hanged. And in so doing, then Mordecai's name and what he did was chronicled by the king of Persia in their official records. Then we come across Haman, who was also very closely associated with the king. And through given situations, he is promoted. And um, Mordecai would not recognize him would not rise up when he came around, would not kowtow to him, chapter 3. So what happened is that Haman cast what they call pur, P-U-R, you might say it would be like casting lots, and plotted to destroy the Jews completely. And he convinced the king to kill all the Jews because he said they speak against, in other words, they're different, totally different, and they were and who they worshipped and how they lived and what they did. But they used this to say this is an opposition to the king and they're not subservient to you. This was to be done on the 13th day of the 12th month of ADAR, ADAR, which is March. There was a proclamation of the destruction, chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Well, Mordecai learns of his proclamation and he does what was typical of the time. He puts off his regular clothes, puts on sackcloth, and sits in the gate with dirt on his head, lamenting loudly the state of affairs. Well, to make a long story a little bit shorter, Esther hears about this, and she inquires about what's going on. And um, Mordecai warns Esther, and we just read that in the passage, that she will not escape unless she uses her position as queen to do something about this, which ought to remind us that sometimes we find ourselves in unique positions to where if we don't act, who is going to act? And we have no reason to shirk our duties, and I speak primarily of our faithfulness to God. Our faith will be tried if we are Christians. Our trust in God and His system will be put to a test. I say this standing before an audience with masks on for some reason. So these things happen, and they usually come at us in a way we least expect and at a time we least expect it. And when we get outside of our routine, outside of our box, outside of our traditions, even when you start to be seated in the auditorium to try to keep from infecting one another, it gets rather strange. <laughs> you feel out of place. And you realize that though we say we must do only what the New Testament authorizes and not as we like or dislike, that when we get out of our normal ways of doing things that have long become traditional to us, it still is a bit of a problem. So we can understand how the devil knows that as well as we do. And now he can take something that may seem rather simple and turn it into something where we least expect it that puts us to the test. In chapter 4 of 13 and 14, verses 13 and 14, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. And that's when we get to think not with thyself that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. In other words, he's saying you are queen, and that's true, and you're highly favored, and you'd have to know something Secular history helps us here about this man Xerxes because he's typical of the ancient absolute monarchs. And don't think because you're in a unique position that you're going to get away with this because she had not made herself known as a Jew to the king. So don't hold your peace at this time. Use your position for the good of your people. And again, you see, we can have a part in God's providential care of the church by using our positions wherever we may be to do what is right when it's difficult so to do.
And then he says, now, if you don't do what you're responsible for doing and use your unique position nobody else has, then you won't escape, but God will take care of his people. That reminds us of the three Hebrew children when they would not bow down to the great idol. And he says, well, I'm going to throw you in the fire if you don't. And they said, well, you can throw us in the fire, but we're not going to bow down to your idol even though God can deliver us. But whether he does or he doesn't, we know what the law of Moses said, and we're not going to worship this idol. And, of course, we see how God worked that. It fits into another situation like this one to teach us today, be faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10. And I'll give you a crown of life. So Esther has a plan, chapter 4, verse 15, through chapter 5, verse 8. 4, 15 through 5, 8. Esther goes in to the king, and she seems to be quite wise, I might say here, and is received favorably. And she invites the king and the Jews' arch enemy, who connived all of this to kill all of them, Haman, to a feast. Then we see Haman's plan against Mordecai set out, chapter 5, 9 through 14. And he's a very proud man because he's been elevated and promoted by the king. He's close to the king. So he boasts to his family about this feast that the queen has invited the king and him to, and just those two alone. The family then, together, actually plots the death of Mordecai and all the Jews. And in his own, uh, we would say in his own backyard, maybe his front yard, I don't know, but in his own residence or at that in the area, he builds... A 50 cubit high gallows. I don't know whether some of you remember it, but I grew up with the old saying, maybe that's because people who live closer to the Bible read these things more in those days. They hung him high as Haman. So you'll see how that turns out. You see the honor of Mordecai in chapter 6, or rather, yes, Mordecai in chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And, and you see God working behind the scenes. Don't forget that. Because the king wouldn't, couldn't sleep one night. So he gets out the chronicles of the Persians. And maybe he thought, you know, this is going to be boring enough to really put me to sleep. I don't know. But he starts reading them. And he comes across Mordecai's service and turning in these two assassins. And he says, was anything ever done for him special because he saved my life and put down this thing? And he was told, no, nothing was ever, ever done like that. And here's where there's quite an enigma because the king asked Haman to come in. And he says, uh, what would you do to honor a man who's close to the king and who's done great things for the king? Well, Haman in all his pride thinks, well, he's talking about me. So I'm going to get to set up just for all will glorify me and the whole kingdom. So he devises an elaborate plan to promote himself. And he says, you know, put on the royal robe, ride on the horse royal, and uh, wear the royal crest, and let, he, let him be led by one of the high nobles, and it be proclaimed what a great man this was, thinking, of course, it would be Hammond. Well, the king points out, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Well, in a moment, he realizes the very man he hates, who will not rise up in his presence, who will not show him obeisance, and who caused him to want to kill all of the Jews, and got a decree from Xerxes to do so. He is the high noble that gets to lead around the horse to the whole city, while uh, Mordecai is declared to be such a great person and in such high favor with the king because of his great work. Well, then you see the completion of the plan that Esther has in chapter 7, 1 through 10. First of all, she reveals her heritage to the king. Then she tells him what has been devised against her people. And then she brings a charge against Haman at the second feast. And Haman is there listening to all of it and seeing his little world. 
that he thought he had everything all sold up to suit himself, to glorify himself, fall down around his ears. So he was taken out and hanged on his own gallows. And by the way, some of the Hebrew word here, wording, and because of the way that the uh, Persians dealt with enemies like this, they think the hanging means he actually was impaled and hung in that way. But be that as it may, his days are ended. So you see then that the king, and this needs to be explained, in the law of the Medes and Persians, once the king, an absolute monarch, had made a decree and it was made law, he couldn't take it back. And we need to understand that because now the king sees what's up. But that date has been set in which all the enemies of the Jews will have free reign on that day to kill them. And in 8, 1 through 17, Esther speaks to the king about the law. But here's where the king is pretty wise too. The king proclaims that the Jewish people are allowed to fight their enemies. And this didn't really give any encouragement to the enemies of the Jews. In fact, a great many non-Jews converted to become Jews. And then in 9, verses 1 through 16, you see the Jewish victory over their enemies. So the Jewish people fought. And many people took the side of the Jews. As I said, many people converted to Judaism. Their enemies were killed, and Haman's ten sons were killed too. And not only that, but a second day of fighting was proclaimed. If they didn't clean up on the first day, then we'll give you another chance. And then there was a celebration of their victories, chapter 9, verses 17 through 32. On the fourteenth day of Adar, A-D-A-R, there was rest in the villages and the small towns, but in Shushan, the palace, the rest was not until the 15th day. Now, this is where all this was heading among the Jews as its history, and they need to read it. Both days are thus honored in the Feast of Purim. You see then in chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, the great notoriety of Mordecai. Now, as best we can do, that is the story introducing the facts. And you can read the book and get the full story there. Are there lessons in this for us? One thing is this. God can use evil men to accomplish good things for his people in working behind the scenes in his providential care. How do I know that? Because I just read the book of Esther and I see how he did it. This man... By the way, Xerxes, King Ahasuerus, was an evil man. If you read about him, he wasn't a good man. He is presented as really caring for Esther, but no, in his everyday operations, he wasn't. Chapter 1, verse 11. Haman was a very evil man. Ahasuerus' evil ended up being Esther's salvation. Who but God can do that? This was all deliberate. This is a letter that doesn't mention God explicitly. But it shows you that God takes care of his own when they undergo very difficult situations, when they are faithful to his word. Haman's evil ended up being the salvation of the Jews. <clears throat> this should remind us of what Paul had to say to the church at Rome and to all of us concerning God overall and working behind the scenes and providentially caring for us. Romans 8, verse 28. And we know, do we? And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love the Lord, and listen, and are called, and who are called according to his purpose. That's the gospel call. And our obedience from the heart to it and our conversion to Christ and our daily living for Him. If we could get this in our head, and Esther can't do it, I don't know what can. God's children and His family, the church, the kingdom of Jesus are very, very special to Him. 
They walk within the boundaries of the favor of God like nobody else on this earth. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are located somewhere. Where? Paul says, in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3. We also see from this a great lesson, and I've already alluded to it, and it's seen in Esther and Mordecai, reminded of it. Courage is a virtue worth rewarding. Courage is a virtue worth rewarding. The courage of Mordecai in refusing to bow to Haman. The courage of Esther in entering the king's presence when she wasn't called. And if he hadn't held up that scepter, she could have been rejected. 2 Timothy 1, verses 7 and 8, Paul told the young preacher, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. We also see from Esther that pride goes before disruption. Of course, that's taught throughout the Bible. Haman's pride promoted Mordecai. God used it to the good of his people. Haman's pride then destroyed himself and his family. How often has that happened? Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and then haughty spirit before a fall. Anger at a person such as Haman had toward Mordecai and all the Jews does nothing but build our own gallows. Haman's anger was driven to in-depth bitterness and hatred for Mordecai. It drove him to build the gallows prior to the king's judgment. Then, when the king learned of Haman's efforts, then he was hanged on his own gallows. Paul says to Christians in Ephesians 4, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and railing be put away from, up from you with all malice. Let me say it again. God takes care of his people. He does it in ways we can never fathom. He can use all sorts of things. In fact, you see it again if you think of Job. Now, the devil had nothing in mind with Job but to destroy him. But God actually used the devil to show Job just how great God was and how God really protected him. God had elevated Esther to queen. God ensured that Mordecai's loyalty was recorded. God worked in the timing of these two feasts. God was involved in Hazard's insomnia and reading the books. And God used those gallows meant for one thing by the evil man to his own purposes. God uses the circumstances to bring great blessings to his people. The thing we as his people must realize is that we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Romans 10, 17. Thus, we view what's happening in this world and to us through the eye of faith, through the teaching of the Bible. Not as if we don't know what's going on and are full of fear like the people of the world. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, God plainly said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, not just say, but boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So, here's the lesson. God's on our side if we love and keep his commandments. God will see us through no matter the suffering we must make in this life. Now what's our job? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation 2.10 We've reviewed the book of Esther and noted some very practical and needful lessons about God's care for us. So let us then go away today realizing that God takes care of his people. And we are God's people today if we do his will. If there's one here that's not a Christian, we discussed a moment ago briefly just the plan of salvation and how one becomes a Christian. As a child of God, if we've committed sin, then the second law of pardon is to repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. 
But all of us need to know that God wants us in heaven with Him. And He's provided a plan in the Bible to get us there. It's through the gospel, the power of God to save. So if you need to obey the gospel, if you need to become a Christian or you need to repent of sins, this invitation is now offered to you while we stand and sing.